why self-love is so important for our immune systems. Hi, it's Diane here at Someone Gets Me, and I have an expert who you are going to love to hear from. Her name is Donna Powers, but here's what's cool about her. She is in Calgary, Canada, and so what I know about all my Canadian friends is the way sometimes they see the world is so different than us in the United States, even though they're right next to us. And since we're coming to this podcast from all over the world, it'll be really fun to hear her thoughts. Donna is a homeopathy healer. She's going to explain to you what that is. And she's also a storyteller. And she's a great gifted woman when it comes to really understanding how loving ourselves and healing and some of the words around healing probably don't work so well. So we're going to challenge some of your beliefs and we're going to expose some things for you to chew on and think about. So if what Donna's saying really resonating with you, check the show notes because you too will be able to contact her and have some cool conversations. So Donna, welcome to the show. Thank you, Diane, so much for the invitation to be here and to be able to share uh, some ideas, some new ways of maybe thinking, challenging our comfort levels with maybe beliefs that we've always carried and uh, we can always have those challenged. Be stretched. Yes, I think for me, it's those challenges that make me stretch a little bit bigger or go, wow, I didn't see it that way that have really yielded the most profound experience in life. So I'm hoping that all of our listeners and viewers can also have the same experience. Yeah. So let's start with how you were raised. Like, tell us a little bit about Donna and your trajectory. Like, because you do some really (laughs) fascinating things. Were you born that way or did you find it along the way? How did it happen? My mother has the little doll that sits on her dresser of her bedroom, in in her bedroom. And it's this doll with blue eyes. And I see you with your blue eyes Mm -hmm. and these braids. And she's looking off into the sky. And that's how she's seen me. That's that's her image of me. So I sometimes joke that I came from the stars and landed on planet Earth. Um, That might not be so far stretched. Apparently, we are made of star material, all of us. Um, Sometimes I think I have a need to apologize for being white, uh, for being middle class, uh, for um, I I had the most ordinary upbringing. Uh, We went to church on Sunday. We had Sunday dinners. uh, So there, there wasn't anything really too exceptional. But my interior world was always curious and taking me on. Um, adventures. And I was a big reader. I learned to read and talk very early in life. That's Mm -hmm. how the story goes. And I've tried many different things over the years. And it would seem like I would master something and then I was on to the next thing. So I resonate with people who have uh, done many things in their lifetime. And uh, yeah, just a curiosity that was came with me when I incarnated. Oh, that's beautiful. That curiosity in the gifted world is an imaginational overexcitability where the brain is just in a different spot, right? And yeah. it's, instead of watching a black and white screen, you're like in a 3D world, you know, with all of this input that's so powerful. And uh, I love it. I just think it's yeah. so exciting. It, it makes for misunderstandings and it makes for people not necessarily getting it. And mm-hmm. there's joy in it. So how do you handle it when somebody just doesn't get you? Well, as a child, I don't think I, I understood that I was perhaps different. Um, my, one of my biggest excitements was being old enough to walk on my own to go to the library to get a library card. Those were the days where you got stamps when you had to bring them back. And books always found me. And my nose was always in a book. And I didn't think anything differently of it. When I got to elementary school, junior high school, And as I opened myself to meeting people in different situations, when they were being really honest with me, they would say something like, oh, I just thought you were a snob. Mm. Mostly it was, I I was this very quiet. I don't think I was terribly shy, um, but I often waited to connect with people. So, and that was an eye opener for me. And, um, It was unusual. It wasn't until 
um, I was in what we would call grade seven. I know everybody has different levels and uh, that sort of thing because you've got a global audience. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was put in with a group who had loved sci-fi. They loved fantasy. They loved imaginative kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And it was for me, I found my home. Oh, yeah. I was so comfortable. Fast forward to the 25th high school reunion that everybody dreads. <laughs> and I saw some of my classmates, the classmates where I felt the most comfortable. And when I said, when I was with our class, it was the most comfortable and understood that I felt. And I got the most unusual looks. Really? And it was like they couldn't believe it. And then I realized I have had a foot in two worlds for all of my life. This imaginative sci-fi storytelling, um, spoken word, written word, poetry, creative, artistic kind of world. And also I could fit in with the sports teams, the jocks, the athletes, mm. um, I, I was academic up to a point, <laughs> and, um, and then, um, you know, um, I struggled. So, and I just, after, once I hit my teens and 18, I, it was like I just followed my nose, and I ended up in Calgary, even though I grew up in uh, Manitoba. So... Yeah, that was the misunderstood experience. And I think with the storytelling, um, you might be part of the world, Women Who Run With Wolves. Yes. Uh, Clarissa Pinkola Estes. And I read the um, story of the ugly duckling. Mm -hmm. And it was like, okay, yeah. I just realized, yeah, I, I didn't know where I fit in. So my inner world was safe. And that's where I would spend time. And that's that far away look. And over the years, I'm now at an age where I'm comfortable in who I am. And that's just been, I can look back and say now it was fun at different places. Mm, not so much fun at all. <laughs> sometimes a road is quite rocky <laughs> or yes. a little tricky or, you know, sometimes I look back and go, wow. All right, so I made it through that. That's interesting. Now I'm yeah. here, okay. <laughs> exactly. And how did I get here? Oh, well, I guess however I got here, it was where I was supposed to be. Right. Oh, I like following your nose. It's so true. It's so yeah. true. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my gosh. It's hilarious. It's like, as you're talking, I'm like, yeah, yeah, I did the same thing. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. You know, yeah. same idea. So what got you turned on to homeopathy? How did that start? Because that is... Homeopathy is amazing. And I don't know that I've had anybody that's really spoken a lot about homeopathy on the mm -hmm. show. So if you could tell us how you got into it and a little bit about it, the mindset that goes with it, mm -hmm. that would be sure. very helpful. Yeah, because it is quite a different paradigm of health. And um, where to begin with that story? I ended up in Calgary. I broke up a significant relationship in Winnipeg. I came here for a holiday, a bit of respite. And I walked into Mount Royal College and it was like, I'm supposed to be here. That was the first following my nose. That was in my early 20s. And for whatever reason, I was in leisure education, community recreation. So community is a word that keeps coming up for me. And I did a paper on how the brain works and the wiring. And why I chose that, I have no idea. And for my final presentation, I did a herbology course. And at the end of the herbology course, um, the instructor said, well, all healing is spiritual. And at that time, I was, um, you know, a, kind of a raving evangelical Christian. That was part of my experience as well. And I thought, well, if all healing is spiritual, then, you know, what's the point of learning all these herbs? Then I got married. I had children. And then one of my oldest child was sick all the time. History of investigative, invasive studies. There's nothing wrong with your child. Well, tell that to a child who's punching himself in the whole genital area before bed every night. My mom heard about a homeopath. I took him to see her and it was one of those magical moments in homeopathy that can happen. Overnight, his problem was gone. Mm -hmm. And I thought, what is this? What right. is this? 
And what I realized was that what I had understood, what sickness and health was all about, it actually had a name and the name was homeopathy. Mm. And it's about the ability to self-heal. It's how we were created. But sometimes the best that this energetic vital force can do is create symptoms. All that vital force needs is energetic support, and then it doesn't have to create symptoms anymore. Made total sense to me. My big stumbling block as I started to use it instead of over-the-counter medicines, I was reading to my husband and I said, these are diluted. These are diluted. He said, well, that wouldn't work if they're diluted. And that was when I learned about energetic potentization of material substance. And it was like, I found it or it found me. I think I was, it's that following my nose, that intuition. I think I was always meant to find it. And then I ended up selling everything I could and went to study. I commuted to Vancouver for four years. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So, um, and in that, I just keep learning more and more about the idea of energetic medicine. And it's time is now, even though. Uh, Dr. Samuel Hahnemann founded it 250 years ago. He was a man way ahead of his time. Oh, yes. So I I believe that like we're all energy beings. And Mm -hmm. so when there's like a wreck, then the energy diverts and goes around and all of that. And so when we rectify the wreck, things can automatically heal. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people who listen to this show are very head head in their head, very smart, gifted (laughs) Smart people. Yeah, and they, me too. <laughs> and they, okay, good. Then this is a good question for you. Yes. <laughs> because they love to try to figure it out. Mm-hmm. And sometimes I say, it, sometimes it's not in figuring that sometimes our brain can't wrap our mind totally around it. Or maybe we can get down there a little bit. So what would you say to the overthinker person who's maybe skeptical or doesn't really get it? How come homeopathy has such great impact? It has such great impact, partly, I think, because it uh, bypasses the intellect. Our mind wants to um, understand cause, effect, that somehow it's out there. And so there's some truth with that. We live at a time where there's tremendous amount of toxicity that we didn't used to have. And so, yes, there are things that can influence us, but not everybody is influenced by the same toxicity. So in a flu season, not everybody gets the flu. But if we have stress in our life or certain things, it's possible we can become susceptible. And um, so homeopathy with working at an energetic level, it can happen that when we feel better, we self-heal. However, that happens, but sometimes we need that little bit of energetic assistance. It's like being around somebody like yourself, you're around them and immediately you just start feeling better. Your whole, you just, you sit a little bit taller, you've remembered to laugh, you've engaged, just like visiting somebody and maybe you were dreading it to begin with. And then you don't know why, you can't say why, but you were just You just feel better because you went and did what you did. And there was an exchange, there was communication, maybe a bit of tears, maybe laughter. And sometimes those are the conversations we need to have within ourselves too. Yes. So a visit within ourselves. Oh, absolutely. That's a great way to describe it because I was just thinking that just the other night I went out for this long bike ride with a friend I haven't seen in a long time. And all day I was like, oh, I really want to go, but it was kind of that subtropical clouds and it wasn't really raining a lot, but it was just like, uh, and I had to drive 30 minutes to get to him. And I, and I knew I was going, but there was this just, I don't know, it was heavy in a way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And when I got there and we're connected and then we started riding our bikes, all of that went away because yeah. of the energy connection, you know, and then later on we had a conversation about our mirror cells. Humans are meant to be connected. And when we're yes. isolated and separate, it causes challenges. Exactly. And that separation can happen within ourselves. We know when we're disconnected with ourselves. Mm-hmm. And I think that the temptation then is to move up into the head. So my lesson this month, we were chatting a little bit prior, um, is the idea of moving it into the heart. So sometimes I'm, I am an intellectual person. 
I love research, that kind of thing. And sometimes I actually have to consciously go, okay, head, you've got lots of ideas. Thank you very much. And where is my heart in this situation? Mm. And often my head is a compensation for any sadness I might be feeling. Mm. And that's me. But, and that's taken years of reconnecting with myself. Right. And some of that sadness is existential. I think, yes. you know, and it's, yeah. so you can't really medicate it. You can't like squash it. It's just kind of there. And so it's about learning how to let the alignment and flow just help bring everything back together. Yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah. It takes a lot of courage to go into your heart, but yet that's the way to do it. Right. Yes. Yeah. So I'd love you to talk a little bit about the immune system. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, everybody's talking about immune system these days, you know, COVID mm -hmm. this and immune system that, and does it really matter? And, but what I understand about homeopathy and from your comments before we started the show, you have a different view of the immune system language wise, even than a lot of people have. And I think it would be important, I think, to stretch all of, all of our minds a little bit and say, well, huh, what if I thought about it this way? Mm -hmm. And so would you share a little bit about that, your view on that? Sure. When I started doing the work that I was doing, I wondered, what does the immune system have to do with energy and energetic medicine? And how does that work? And then when I would teach my classes on the immune system, it was important to me, this is the head part of me, to um, research, understand a bit of anatomy, physiology, and some pathology, and why do we get sick? Hahnemann wrote his own book, The Organon, with his ideas about what is health and what is sickness. And with him, uh, good health allows us to be free in who we are mm -hmm. to do what we're supposed to be doing. And that was so beautiful for me. Um, and that's an aphorism. It's almost poetic, but in kind of an ancient language, you have to persist a little bit when you're reading it. So... I started to try and integrate that with the immune system. And as I started to read and do my research, I was so aware that the language we use for our immune system are war metaphors, mm -hmm. attack, defend, a battle. Um, oh, and that was my first challenge. When I teach, I just ask people, how would you describe the immune system? And right away, we move to these war metaphors. And my suggestion always is, what if we think about it as being a community, a conversation, a communication, mm. and a commensal, eating at the same table as? And these ideas came to me from, um, oh, one of them uh, was a medical doctor who was a follower of uh, Waldorf School and Rudolf Steiner. And then as I dug deeper into the science, there's very little of us that's actually human, very tiny portion that has <laughs> consciousness and this vitality, this energy. Because when we die, and this was Hahnemann's observation, when we die, we just go back to soil, back to dirt. What was animating us? What was coordinating everything? Is it our mind? Well, no, not really. And what is that? And he called that vital force. Yes. So viruses and bacteria, we're mostly virus and bacteria. Talk to any scientist. They'll tell you that. We've got fungi, our cells. The viruses are these little messengers that are talking back and forth, carrying packets of information. The electric, electron microscope now has opened up a whole new world. That was one of my, uh, my insights uh, when I took uh, anatomy and physiology at the med sciences at the University of Calgary, they showed under an electron microscope, there's no boundaries. You look in an anatomy text and it looks like the cell is there and it's, but what you find out, there's all these openings and closings and everything is porous. So where do I end? Where does the world outside me begin and end? Mm. And you start to find out that you are part of a whole system. And there's a whole system within you. Wow. And we're all connected. All connected. And we're all connected energetically. And for me, that's the idea of the immune system. It goes beyond just um, 
function and structure of cells and hormones and a virus. We, we have them here all the time. They're here all the time. Right. And what is it? What's happening when we get sick? Does that mean our immune system is not working? Actually, no. What it means is our immune system is working very well. So having a healthy immune system is, for me, having sicknesses from time to time. It's like that's the natural detox. Mm. Is having an immune system that functions. And so I've, I've likened it. And um, I'm really grateful to, and I wish I could remember his name. It'll come to me. But he's the one um, who helped me understand that the immune system is more like a cleanup crew. And when we are not attending with self-love and care and good nutrition, our choices, um, it's like we've had a party inside and the party needs to clean up. Well, guess who's there? Commensals eating at the same table as the virus. So the virus starts the cleanup, but it's got to dump its toxins somewhere. So it dumps those and the immune system goes, whoa, 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 whoa. No right. more parties, no more parties. So it, it then initiates a whole cascade of events and we get rid of stuff through our discharges. And that is healthy. When we get stuck in it, it's uncomfortable, but that's where homeopathy will come in energetically to support that vital force to create a fever or whatever needs to be created to do the cleanup. So it's an energetic support system that helps us self-heal, continue to self-heal. I love that. <laughs> I'm listening to you. I'm going, oh my, because I, I never liked all those war metaphors in general, <laughs> like fight cancer, fight this. And I don't, <laughs> I, it doesn't resonate with me. And no one's ever explained homeopathy to me the way you just did. And I'm like, yeah. whoa, hold on a minute here. Yeah. And, and it makes sense. That's the detox. That's, that's the cleaning the out. That's the getting rid of, I call it the gooky stuff because I try not yeah. to put high energy labels on things. It's all that yeah. gooky, slimy, whatever it is. Yeah. And we have to get rid of it somehow. Yes. And we either have to blow it out, have it leak out, pee out, poop out, sweat. And these are places, um, and I continue to do this work, and um, I, I'm not highly skilled or eloquent with um, chakras. But this month has all been about some with my other work that I do, my personal work, um, is that first chakra area and how much shame and guilt and uh, lack of self-love there is for all of us. I know I include myself in that. And mm -hmm. as much as I do the therapy work that I've done and awareness, um, how do you move um, into that place of love? And I was uh, working with one of our... Um, colleagues through our business support group uh -huh. and um, it was so wonderful because she said in the Kabbalah and I'm sure I'm not even saying it correctly um, and in the tradition she's familiar with there's a blessing for the first ripe peach of the season and there's a blessing for a poop and I thought oh how wonderful is that you know wow. and yeah and so yeah these discharges they're, they're wonderful. We can say thank you. And I know how hard it is. I was so sick over Christmas um, this year. And you wonder, where does this mucus come from? Like, how much of it can I produce? Right. Well, apparently, we produce as much of it as is needed to detox. And wow. then once it's done, like, you know that feeling you get after you have been sick and with a lot of discharges, it's like you have a new lease on life. And you go, ah, oh, I forgot how good it feels mm -hmm. just to be alive. Yes. Yes. But I never thought of it that way, but it's so true. It's like, mm -hmm. yeah. oh yeah. my, you know, that's really, really fascinating. Yeah. So you said a comment a little while ago that, that I would like you to elaborate on when you said that when you're feeling pain or grief, you tend to run into your head. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of people um, that listen to the show that really are mental heavy, which is why mm -hmm. I asked about the energy part. Mm -hmm. So what are some things that you do personally to help yourself come into your heart? 
Um, do you have any tips or any things that you do? I'm hoping that somebody will hear you and maybe practice some of those things because a lot of people are, I, I, they're like, like sticks walking with a big brain and yes. there's like a, there's like a cutoff right here. And, yes. uh, right. And what do you do to like get rid of the cutoff? Um, well, um, it usually happens that I need to pay attention to what's happening in my body. I've become disembodied. Like you, that stick idea is just such a good um, visual. Mm -hmm. And so the first thing to do is just come right back into my body. And there's a gesture that a lot of people use when they're feeling better. And you can see it when people come into themselves, but it's like this and it is an alignment. Mm. Or sometimes I have to pay attention to uh, my shoulders are tight. Um, I'm stiff. I'm overworking. That's my big one. That's one of my big clues is I'm pushing myself and pushing myself and my mind is going mm. and going. And so sometimes I actually just have to physically go, okay, close my eyes and move and even put my hand on my heart mm. and stop myself before I get too carried away. But that's the beauty of being energetic beings mm -hmm. in a physical form. Our bodies are going to tell us. And in fact, this is the only way energy can communicate is through our symptoms, either our feelings, our emotions, um, perhaps our thoughts, but physical symptoms as well. And this is when you go to see a homeopath. Um, we have all different places where we kind of hold whatever it is that is out of balance for us. And that's the only way we know that the energetic vital force is out of balance. It's the only way it can communicate. And when we don't have symptoms, we're in alignment as a rule, unless we're into real severe pathology, but that's a whole other conversation. Conversation. Yes. So when people have the belief that a si if they have a symptom, it means they've done something wrong. Yes. That is an error in their thesis statement. Um, that is about judging. Yes. That's self-criticism, that's self-loathing, mm -hmm. that's self-judgment. And this is where then you can harness your mind because journaling has been a great place for me. And sometimes what I do is have a conversation and use my dominant and non-dominant hand. And when I use my non-dominant hand to answer, I have to really slow down so I can ask the question. Um, my um, digestion is bad. I'm not being able to digest my food. Can you tell me what's happening? And then you move to the non-dominant hand and wait for an answer. Sometimes that can happen in a very skillful homeopathic consult, the homeopath will be listening for patterns of energy mm. because our patterns are often reflected not just in our physical symptoms, but in our emotional symptoms or in our mind symptoms. And they can all be happening at the same time. Mm. If you can do that for yourself, it's wonderful because then you're hearing yourself, you're accepting yourself, you're loving yourself. And when that judgment voice comes in, that's when we can put ourselves into conflict again. Um, but a homeopath will be able to pull those threads together. And then it's almost shamanic this way, borrow something from nature that is in a homeopathic resonant form that matches and is a little bit stronger and then it gives the support to the vital force that needs to heal energetically so generally what will happen is you will feel better in yourself even if you've got digestive problems eventually you want those to be gone as well it's very subtle mm. so that's the next stage of it is matching energies i love how it helps support the vital force it's not, like you said, it's not the war thing of we're going to attack what's wrong. We're going to support the vital force that then will take care of things in whatever right. the natural way is, which to me sounds so freeing. Yes. Like that's exciting to me. Like, oh, I want it. I want to experience more of that. Yes. In general, you know. And that's the, so that we are free to do what we are here on earth to do in this incarnated form. 
some people, um, the example I like to use is Maddie Stepanek. He was on the Oprah Winfrey show. Mm -hmm. He was a young boy who had a lot of um, ailments and he was born with them. Um, he was doing what he was supposed to be doing in the form that he took. So for him, there wasn't a need to support, to self-heal, to cure, to miraculously get out of his wheelchair. He was already free in himself. Yes. So a 90-year-old woman crippled with arthritis um, might not need support at that energetic level because she's quite fine where she's at with that. Whereas somebody who has a splinter in their finger, they just can't cope. You know, those are extremes. Um, but then you can use a homeopathic remedy and yeah, the sliver will come out or you can dig it out or you can go see the doctor. But it has limited that person in how they function in their mm -hmm. world with their mm -hmm. purpose, their reason for being. Yes, that's so amazing. So where does self-love come into this? Because I think self-love and how really decreasing fear and all that angsty stuff is really what supports our immune system and the rest of us, of course. Mm -hmm. And so how do you see self-love kind of weaving into this conversation? Well, self-love for me has been a challenge as a human being because it's really easy to judge, to criticize, um, to feel shame, uh, to feel like it's my fault. Um, I've done something wrong and bad. And to the person that's really helped me with that, um, the little bit that I've studied with her is Pema Chodron mm -hmm. yes. and the idea of being mm -hmm. with something. So I think in some ways it's easier to be with somebody else when they have a conflict or an issue or a health problem. You can sit with them and witness and uh, show love and concern. Can we be as kind with ourselves? Mm -hmm. And when we can move into that place of self-love, there is a vibration. This is resonance. This is energy. And you read about people who cure themselves of, of very serious pathology and diseases. So, yes, they make nutritional kinds of things, but there's that acceptance often that comes with the self-love. And this isn't the narcissistic kind of... Although Carolyn Mace is wonderful, she calls going through the stages, uh, there's a stage of necessary narcissism. And I can identify that with some of my personal growth. I would hit those stages where it was just about me um, right. after a postpartum depression. It was, this is about me. And uh, she called, I, I was really quite relieved to hear that necessary narcissism. You don't want to get stalled there, there. And you don't want spiritual bypasses you want to stay with what is even if it's uncomfortable it really helps if you've got somebody to witness that and you are also self-witnessing and loving yourself as much as you would um, a child so that's the inner child work i'm i'm from that generation we did inner child work um we were looking for meaning yes, in everything did. and um i think it's been part of our uh, evolution to do that. Yes. Inner child work. I still yeah. play with my six-year-old all the time. <laughs> yeah. Oh, totally. Totally. It's totally fun. And I'm, I'm glad I, I learned that because it's like, oh, okay, we can go have fun. We don't have to yeah. be serious all the time. <laughs> exactly. And my inner child will start getting really, really, really sad um, when I've been doing too much the adult in my head thing. And, um, and then I'm, I'm not resonating love. I mean, the resonance of love is quite profound. And I, I think that our great spiritual teachers embody that, the Buddha, Jesus. Mm -hmm. um, and if we can be in that kind of presence, I think that's when our immune systems are functioning ultimately. Are <clears throat> and we're not even thinking about who we are, or what we're doing. We are being who we are. Mm. Yep. That schism starts to melt down and go away. And then, like you said earlier, with the way the cells are all going and everything's opening and closing and all of that, it lets that free flow of energy yeah. work better and on every level. So, of course, the immune system is enhanced, but so is everything else mm -hmm. because 
then we're more alive and more we're more vital. That's the vital force. Like it all goes together. Everything's connected to everything. Mm-hmm. Inside and outside, right? And we can be more free in our sadness. We can be more free in whatever emotion that needs to be expressed. Right. Um, and if we grew up with um, don't cry or I'll give you something to cry about or, you know, boys don't cry, um, those kinds of things. So when we're feeling sad, it's appropriate for us to cry. Tears are a discharge. They're salty. Our cells use salt for cellular regulation. If we're holding down our tears because we're grief, that's another big one where I see people um, with sadness, all kinds of self-judgment and criticism about it. And maybe we've been grieving two years over a pet. And, you know, um, if, it, if it's not us giving unkind messages to ourselves, oh, get over it, you know, this is ridiculous, two years. Mm-hmm. And I still can't bring myself to get another pet or somebody says that to us those tears need to be released. They're staying somewhere in our bodies. Mm-hmm. Yes, And that, body, is, the, that is when we get sick. Right. Yeah. Because when the body's bearing that burden and it doesn't get to get released, then that's when everything gets dragged down and the sickness comes in. Right. Some symptoms somehow. Right. And we want to support that vital force energetically to self-heal. So sometimes we give somebody a remedy and they cry and cry and cry. Um, they'll call me up and say, I hate this remedy. All I've been doing is crying. The crying eventually stops. But I think sometimes with conventional medicine, the symptom is treated and what you have is a suppression. Mm -hmm. And then you move deeper, say, into a depression. So the judgment we have about being depressed and in the current situation with the um, virus and lockdown and being separated it's so much not who we are as a tribe. Uh, we are mammals that need our tribe. And um, just like we are in our inner world of our immune system, uh, we need every part that's in there. And if we isolate one part from the other or suppress that one part from the other, it has consequences Yes, within. So in the face of all this separation and this virus and all of the things that are going on, would you have a couple tips you might want to share with people of what they could do to kind of, even if it's just to keep going you know, yes. <laughs> and, and not create more of a problem for themselves? Or is there some things they could do energetically? Um, energetically? Well, of course, I would suggest homeopathic remedies. There are ways to use homeopathy as prevention. And especially, I learned so much. I I ran some courses on the virus itself, um, but just on homeopathic remedies and tissue salt. They're a little different um, than homeopathic remedies, but they are prepared homeopathically in that pharmacy of dilution and potentization, creating resonance. And um, for the elderly, um, there are some wonderful things you can do. So... um, I won't go into details here, but people are welcome to contact me and I can direct them to some resources. Um, It's very hard when it's the group that has been so affected are our elderly um, loved ones, particularly in nursing homes where touch is so important. So um, I like to hold our workers in a great deal of prayer and energy, however that works for most people. Um, And for ourselves to be aware, now I'm an introvert, so this isolation was easy for me in some ways, uh, but I am married, so I have a partner and we've been able to talk, but uh, for single people on their own, this has been, you know, very difficult. Even my parents who are uh, in their 80s and 90s, Um, The isolation was very difficult, very, very difficult. But again, we were able to use homeopathic remedies, talk on the phone every day. And um, yeah, this has been an extremely difficult situation. And I guess Carolyn Mace is who I turn to uh, about the opportunity and what is happening globally and what is in the one is in the all. So if we can even develop... um, ourselves to understand how connected we are and this is the immune system for me again Mm -hmm. to communicate it um, to even be able to say I am so lonely I am sad be able to say that to one other person 
if they can, because lots of times we aren't able to get homeopathic remedies to them. Although in Italy, there are a number of um, Italian medical doctors who are homeopaths and they were doing tremendous work um, mm. because they, they really were affected by it. So you can take remedies preventatively. Um, it's an opportunity um, to really go inward as well. And that's a hard thing to do, mm. especially if we have overwhelming fear. But again, we've got homeopathic remedies that will address the fear. Fear of germs, fear of going out to the public, fear of being alone, uh, fear of those transitions. So the homeopaths, um, how they were working as well, there were some great resources. And you could, for free, you would be assigned a homeopath, and then you would just go pick up your remedy, or the remedy would be mailed to you. It's just such an elegant way of supporting um, and with the speaking with the homeopath, lots of times when we can hear ourselves speaking, there's that self-love that starts to move in again. Sometimes after a consult, somebody will say, wow, I just, I feel so much better. Mm. So it's that talking it out as well. And, and there's, yeah. And being heard. And being heard. Exactly. Right. You know, yeah, like- I'm, somebody gets me. Yes, somebody gets Some, me, right. Someone gets me because I somebody actually hears me and it lands on them and it's not pushed away or minimized, but it's heard and received. Mm-hmm. That's self-love in action. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And I think that's what we, is ultimately as a homeopath, um, how you want um, that to go in a consult is that giving and the receiving mm-hmm. and somebody actually can feel, wow, I, I've, I could hear myself and I feel like I have been heard and this person really gets me. Yeah. So we share a lot in common, Diane, (laughs) with what we do. We just have a different name for what we do. Oh yes, we do. I love it. I'm like going, Oh my gosh, this is cool. Yes. So in your work, do you uh, work with people like virtually, like if somebody's listening to you right now and they're in the U S or another place in Canada or wherever, I mean, they contacted you would, do you work with people virtually or just um, I, I did I'm not doing so much one-on-one private consults anymore mm-hmm. um, my focus has been online education I was doing online education before it became a necessity for a lot of people so it was quite uh, quite synchronicity and serendipitous for me because I was all prepared um, but my whole thrust right now is to empower people to use their home kits my little tagline is homeopath homeopathic kit in every home and to know how to use it safely and successfully whether you are at home or traveling and I um, all of my courses are geared to that so I recommend everybody has a home kit and then you can contact your homeopath virtually so many of them that's what they're doing right now and a Schussler um, 12 tissue cell salt kit And with that, you don't have to worry about having to run out to the pharmacy and um, getting your over-the-counter medications. You can use your kit and then be in touch with the homeopath. Free resources during this outbreak, homeopaths globally all got together. And there's no reason uh, why anybody couldn't consult with a homeopath with acutes. And that's my emphasis now is um, making sure people... Um, have what they need, the tools that they need. And so once you're in my course, um, I'm available for those kinds of, you know, I've tried this, this didn't work, I've tried that. And then as a collective, again, this idea of a community um, will post and my child has this and these are the symptoms, I've tried this, this isn't helping. And we help each other out with that. Oh, that's magical. And, And this sense of community is so important. It is. And we're going to put links to your courses and all of the ways to contact you in the show notes so that if you're interested in what Donna's talking about, like I am, I'm going to be checking it out even more because I think it's so important that we really begin to embrace a a paradigm that serves our energetics. Exactly. And that's what Carolyn Mace would say is we're moving into energy now. We've moved from the nuclear bomb, the atomic, into the energetic and our medicine can reflect that as well. 
Yeah. Yes. I've been walking around for years saying we're energy beings. It's like woven burlap. Can't you see it all? The organs are suspended on energy. I could just see it all intuitively. Yes. And people would look at me like, Diane, this is it. You're over the edge. Yes. And, <laughs> and, and maybe I was, but I don't think I was. And so I'm no. sitting here talking to you going, oh my God, look. Yeah. And I know I've known, I know homeopathy works and I know mm-hmm. it's cool. Yeah. Now I know much more about it thanks to you. Like, oh, yeah. that's why I love it. Oh, you know, I've said oh in my head about twice as many times as it came out of my mouth because yeah. it's it's exciting. And mm-hmm. and I love the fact that you're doing courses because the, another interesting thing is I believe it's a numbers game. And how mm. many people can we reach who are reaching yes. other people, who are affecting yes. other people? Like if we're really going to help the energy and the vital force of all of us come back alive, even more so, then it's a numbers game. It's like, how many people can even embrace a little bit of it to affect the next people, affect the next people? And so when you said that you do courses, I'm like, of course you do. Because Yes. Yeah. And that was them. always my vision um, that, you know, beneath or behind or surrounding the tagline, a homeopathic kit in every home is the idea of creating satellites of communities everywhere that are connecting virtually. And I had always predicted a pandemic. Always. It was, it wasn't, it was not an if, but it was when, Mm -hmm. and that was just came out with that. So for me, it's, you know, I know now all over Alberta, even globally, I've got people in New Zealand and Australia, they will be able to help others. Um, even um, in these acute illnesses, these acute situations, chronic disease is a whole other kettle of fish, but right. um, oh. these acute illnesses. Yeah. So for me, my experience was similar to yours. I knew there was something out there and I didn't know what its name was. Right. And then when my son got sick, I went, oh, homeopathy. This is the thing I knew, and it has a name. Yes. And this is its name. And it's a thing, and people it's know about thing. it too. <laughs> yes, and it's, yeah, it's, it, and it works on a different kind of paradigm and understanding. And I just want to add, too, with my courses, it's been really important to me. Charles Eisenstein has been a big influence in my life. Mm-hmm. It's a pay-what-you-can model. And um, really and truly, whatever your financial situation for my courses um, just send me a note and we'll have a conversation and it's really truly pay what you can, not a minimum amount or whatever, but, uh, what will work for you. And I have so much free stuff on my website. So if you're a little bit nervous, mm-hmm. cause I know if, if you go do a little bit of Google research on homeopathy, you're also going to find a conflicting information. Sure you are. So I hope that, um, I just so grateful for the opportunity, Diane, to, presented in a way that hopefully makes sense to people and um, that they get it. Not just somebody gets me, but somebody gets homeopathy. (laughs) Right. And, and, you know, so many of us have been so steeped in the old way, the battle Mm -hmm. way um, that it's a stretch sometimes. Mm -hmm. And, and I believe in stretching myself and others. Mm -hmm. And I believe that those of us who people maybe didn't get or feel that, separation somehow it's because maybe there's a part of us that already gets it and we just don't know what Mm -hmm. it is yet Mm -hmm. so we're going to make sure that your website is in our show notes and I encourage all of you to contact Donna follow her around on social media if you want to um, get her free stuff sign up for her courses and let her know you heard her here because if we're going to start a wave of positive amazing energy then it starts with us and exactly it starts with our awareness and it starts with our yes Yes. So I have one last question for you. Absolutely. If there was a big billboard we were going to put up and the whole world was going to see your message on it, what would you put on that billboard? Oh, there was a tagline that used to be on my newsletter. Forgive yourself, love generously. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Forgive yourself, love generously. You heard that everybody from yes. Donna Powers today yeah. here on Someone Gets Me. <laughs> uh, and I want to thank you so much for taking the time out of your day and away from your family to be here with us on the show. 
what a rich amount of content. I think I might have to do a second interview because there's so many other things yes. that I want to talk about. I want to talk about the power of storytelling. I did a whole series on it quite some time ago, and I think I might do another st- series on it. There's so many other things, and I just thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you, Diane. I so appreciate the invitation and being with you and spending time with you. Oh, it's been magical. Yeah. So remember, everybody, to keep your face to the sun so the shadows fall behind you because you're a rock star.